This is video podcast 49 from learningradiology.com, Childhood Hip Diseases. Hello, I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. This podcast will focus on three childhood hip diseases, developmental dysplasia of the hip, leg calve perthes disease, and slip capital femoral epiphysis. Developmental dysplasia of the hip, also called congenital hip dysplasia or congenital hip dislocation, is present at birth. It's five to nine times more common in females and ten times more common in babies born by breech presentation. It is bilateral in about a third of cases, and when it is unilateral, it's more common on the left than the right. It is much more common in Caucasians and rare in African Americans. Clinically, the pediatrician looks to elicit an Ortolani click or clunk. The hip is dislocated by AD adducting it and then relocated by abduction, abduction, and the click is heard or felt on relocation of the hip. Other causes of dislocated hips include neurological disorders and sometimes hypothyroidism. Imaging, ultrasound, is the modality of choice in infants between about four weeks and six months of age. There are angles that can be measured using ultrasound, including the alpha angle, or the ultrasound can be done using dynamic scanning. Ultrasound is generally used before ossification of the secondary ossification center of the capital femoral epiphysis. Once the capital femoral epiphyses have ossified or calcified at about three to six months of age, measurements can be made more accurately on an AP view of the pelvis using conventional radiography. This is a normal pelvis in a three-year-old, and we're going to go through some of the indices that can be used to measure the normal versus abnormal hip. First of all, there is a horizontal line that can be drawn using the inferior borders of the triradiate cartilage, which is called the Hilgenreiner line or the Y line. Then two lines perpendicular to the horizontal line at the outer edge of the acetabuli can be drawn. This is called Perkins line, and this forms two sets of grids with four quadrants each. There's an upper outer and a lower outer quadrant for each of the four grids, and an upper inner and lower inner quadrant. Normally, the femoral head lies in the lower inner quadrant of each grid. When the head is dislocated, it moves superiorly and laterally. Another measurement that can be made is a line which is drawn from the inferior aspect of the femoral neck through the inferior border of the obturator foramen, which is called Shenton's line. It should form a smooth curve, and when the hip is dislocated, Shenton's line is disrupted because the femoral shaft moves outward and upward. And lastly, there is an angle which can be measured using, again, the horizontal line and then another line which is drawn from the junction of the horizontal line and the triradiate cartilage out to the outer aspect of the acetabulum, basically from the inner to the outer aspects of the acetabuli. This is called the acetabular angle or the acetabular index, and it usually measures less than about 20 to 25 degrees after the age of one. It corresponds geometrically to the alpha angle that is measured on ultrasound. And in patients with congenital hip dysplasia, this acetabular angle or index becomes enlarged, usually 30 degrees or greater. So this is a case in which there are bilateral hip dislocations. If we draw our horizontal line and then drop the two perpendiculars from the outer edges of the acetabuli, we can clearly see that the capital femoral epiphysis, even if it were ossified, would not lie within the lower inner quadrants where the X's are, that in fact the red ovals that are flashing are where the capital femoral epiphyses will appear, and they are in the upper outer quadrants, so both of these femoral heads are dislocated.
If we measure the acetabular index or angle in this patient, we can also see that the angle is much greater than 20 degrees, 47 degrees on the left and 45 on the right. Here's another child with bilateral hip dislocations who has campomelic dwarfism. If we draw the horizontal line or the Y line and then drop our two perpendiculars, we can see that the femoral heads, were they to be ossified, would not lie within the lower inner quadrants where the yellow circles are. So both of these heads are dislocated. The treatment for developmental dysplasia of the hip, conservative treatment consists of placing a splint in order to maintain the hip in flexion and abduction so that it remains located. Surgical treatments usually consist of some form of pelvic osteotomy. Lake Calve Perthes disease is essentially avascular necrosis of the capital femoral epiphysis. Its peak incidence is five years of age with a range of between about four and eight. Males are five times more often involved than females, and it is bilateral in about 10% of cases. The bilateral involvement is usually one hip after the other rather than both of them being abnormal at the same time. Bilateral involvement in females is very rare. Clinical findings include a limp, limitation of range of motion, and pain, which can frequently be referred to the knee. The first sign of Lake Calve Perthes disease may be a joint effusion, which produces lateral displacement of the head. One of the early findings on nuclear medicine is decreased uptake in the region of the femoral head on bone scan because of the avascular nature of this disease. The head may be smaller on the affected side, and there may be a subarticular lucency, which is called the crescent sign, that is seen best on a frog lateral view. Then the epiphysis goes on to become flattened, fissured, fragmented, and dense. Throughout this process, the articular cartilage is usually preserved. And with revascularization, there can be gradual reformation of the femoral head. MRI is being used for early diagnosis of Lake Calve Perthes disease. These are two conventional radiographs on the same individual. The first is a frontal radiograph, which shows slight widening of the joint space on the right, but which is a very subtle finding. On the frog lateral, though, it is clear that the right femoral head is flatter than the left, and it's also slightly smaller. Here's an individual with a more advanced case of Lake Calve Perthes disease in which there is flattening and fragmentation of the right femoral capital epiphysis. And in this kitty, there's flattening and increased density of the capital femoral epiphysis on the right side. Treatment includes adjustments to weight-bearing, traction, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, physical therapy, and sometimes surgical osteotomy procedures. Slipped capital femoral epiphysis, or SCIFI, is a disease of adolescence. This may be due to a hormonal effect that occurs in adolescence. Some postulate there is a reorientation of the cartilage at that age. There is a higher incidence of slip capital femoral epiphyses from June through September. And this is, remember, a Salter-Harris type 1 epiphyseal fracture. Skiffy usually affects boys, African Americans much more commonly. Between the ages of about 10 to 15, this is a disease of teenagers, and the affected individuals are frequently heavier and or taller than their counterparts. In girls, it occurs at a younger age, usually starting somewhere around 8. And it can be bilateral in about 20 to 25 percent of cases. Bilaterality is much more frequent in girls, in boys, when it's unilateral, the left hip is involved twice as often as the right. The head and neck may be osteoporotic early in the disease, and then the epiphyseal plate itself may become widened and indistinct. The head will slip posteriorly, medially, and inferiorly with reference to the metaphysis and produce a varus deformity of the hip.
If we draw a line along the lateral edge of the femoral neck on an AP view of the pelvis, that line will not intersect the epiphysis in a kitty with slip capital femoral epiphysis. The metaphysis is displaced laterally and no longer overlaps the posterior lip of the acetabulum, where in a normal individual it forms a small triangular density, and this sign is called the loss of the triangle sign of Kapaner. Later in the disease, there may be buttressing of the medial and posterior aspects of the neck. So this is a normal pelvis, and if we draw a line along the outer border of the femoral neck, it should normally intersect a portion of the capital femoral epiphysis. And there also should be a small triangle where the metaphysis overlaps the posterior lip of the acetabulum. This is normal. Here's an individual with slip capital femoral epiphysis. On the AP view, the epiphysis is slightly smaller. On the frog lateral view, the slip becomes much more evident because the line drawn along the outer aspect of the femoral neck intersects no part of the epiphysis, as is shown by the red arrow. This child has skiffy on the left. The epiphysis has slipped medially, posteriorly, and inferiorly. The epiphyseal plate is widened, and there is a loss of the overlapping triangle of Kapaner. This child has slipped capital femoral epiphysis on the right side. The right epiphysis is smaller. The line on the left intersects a portion of the epiphysis. The line on the right does not. This is someone who had a slip capital femoral epiphysis years before, which were not corrected, and there is, you can see, buttressing increased bone growth of the femoral necks in order to account for the varus deformity bilaterally. The treatment for Skiffy is internal fixation using nails or pins. Complications include degenerative arthritis, a varus deformity, or avascular necrosis that occurs in from 6 to 25 percent of cases. To review, the timeline for childhood hip diseases, developmental dysplasia of the hip occurs at birth, late calve perthes disease around five years of age, and slip capital femoral epiphysis is a disease of teenagers. This is a chart which you can download at learningradiology.com slash hipdiseases.pdf that demonstrates the various parameters that differentiate developmental dysplasia of the hip, late calve perthes disease, and slip capital femoral epiphysis. So it's time for your mini quiz. This is a nine-year-old female with hip pain. Pause your computer or MP3 player to decide which of these three diseases you think this child has. Well, if you look carefully, you can see that the right capital femoral epiphysis is smaller than the left. There is no evidence of slip, and this is a kitty who has Le Calve Perthes disease of the right hip. LearningRadiology.com has come to Twitter. You can receive a different imaging sign every day tweeted to you if you sign up at twitter.com slash radsigns. Each weekday, you'll get a different imaging sign that you can read.